team was an interministerial body set up by the president, championed by CTFM in particular and other media houses against illegal mining. President Paul Boateng's interview set the cut among the pigeons. The GTV report was then followed by a report that the presidency had ordered an investigation into the claims made by the professor. Indeed, that some of the claims he made had been forwarded to the CID to further investigate. So while all that was going on, US-based media practitioner Kevin Taylor then releases on his television program details of the 36-page report, which provide very graphic and scathing views by the former minister on the way the IMSIM was dysfunctional, on the role of key officials both in government within the presidency and in ministries, departments, and agencies against the fight that he was leading to restore our environment. And of course, it then got into the media reportage of specific people mentioned in the report coming out to refute various aspects of the report. So, so this is the brief history of the, the first thing uh, put on, on, on that TV show was actually submitted to the chief of staff in March 2021. So it's over two years old. And it's a 36-page report with lots of information. I'll start by showing you whose names are mentioned in the report and then quickly go through the arrangement of the report. And then we'll, we'll come into some of the key quotes made by the, the professor. Then we will also show you the reactions that have come in from the specific personalities mentioned in the report. And then more importantly, we will ask about seven key institutions, key questions that remain unanswered in this report. Then we'll conclude with our own observations. Hopefully we'll also speak to the Member of Parliament who has written to Shraj to cause an investigation into all of this. So who are the key persons mentioned in the report? Of course, Professor Mfon Boateng is a key figure. He is the former Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation in the first term of the MPP government. Of course, all of this revolves around the President and the Chief of Staff. This report was submitted to the Chief of Staff in March 2021. Now, the arrangement of the report essentially looks at the background of the setting up of the IMSIM, their mandate, and the legal regime around which this was set. And of course, the key actors would then include people who were mentioned. Now, the way the media has covered this will seem to suggest that from the get-go, big names are mentioned. Actually, that's not what it is. Apart from Gabriel Chudak, whose name was mentioned in, on page three initially as part of some sort of executive summary, and then who was later discussed when he was talking about the activities of two mining companies, CJ, Alaska, and Heritage. The names are grouped under a, a, a very a specific paragraph. So he outlines 10 subheadings, right? So he talks about members of the IMSIM abandoning the committee. He speaks about mining in forest reserves. He speaks about the unwholesome behavior of MPP and government appointees. He then delves into mining activities of MPP officials and government appointees. There's even time spent on NDC and the Agalamse activities as well. We'll talk about that too. He discusses <clears throat> the community mining fiasco. He then comes to the controversial issue of the missing excavators, the so-called missing excavators, which he believes was a media framing, which wasn't really accurate. The, the ban of in excavator for small-scale mining, the manu ban of manufacture, transportation, and use of dredging equipment or chunk funds, and then the influence of big men affiliated to government and activities of Operation Vanguard. So it is under the paragraph 9 that you see the names of some of the people mentioned, like uh, Gabi Otredaku, Kojo Opon, Kroma, uh, Charles Bisu, who was working with him, Donald Entia, who is the CEO of, uh, a co-owner of CJ Alaska or CNJ Alaska and later Heritage. He also mentions the former MP4, uh, Manson Quanta, Joseph Albert Kwam. And then other names are mentioned, people in the presidential office, like somebody called Frank Asiru Bequin, Charles Nite Kotego, Charles Ousu, whose name comes up a lot. There's also Sir John. Sir John. There's a lot of Sir John in there, who was at the time the head of the Forestry Commission, chief executive. Then there's also S.K. Boafo, who was the board of the Minerals Commission. And then there was Ekoe Wusi in the case of the Galamse excavators, and then other people 
Kojo Ponkroma is also mentioned, and then Kweku Baku's name also comes up. All right. Now, let's, let me first start off by showing you some of the key quotes in the reports that jump at you. So on page three, there's a very serious claim on page three of this report that the major challenge that the IMSIM had in the mining communities occurred in 2018. I need to say that another big name mentioned is the minister at the time for lands who took over from John Peter Ameo. So John Peter Ameo was minister for lands between 2017 and part of 2018. He was later on replaced by the Honorable Asoma Treme. And it's very clear that Professor Vivon Boateng's work and the minds, I mean, he clashed with Asoma Treme a lot. And if you read page three, it says, it will be mentioned of the second minister for lands in, when the forestry commission and the ministry of lands itself decided to give out almost all the forest reserves in this country for mining activities now this whole imsim had been set up because our forests and water bodies were being destroyed by especially unapproved small-scale mining and large foreign entities mining in concessions using unsustainable means of mining so the first thing that jumps at you is how the former minister accuses no mean a person than his colleague minister, the minister and the ministry of mines, of essentially sabotaging the work of the IMSIM. And then also the Forestry Commission Chair, Sir John, the late Sir John. And we will come back to this. In fact, on the same page, there's a quote I want to show you. It says, this view was reported to cabinet at a meeting on 28th February 2019. He actually publishes the cabinet letter on page four of the report, reporting that the Forestry Commission and the Ministry of Mines were busy giving out mining concessions within a period when mining was to have been halted within forests. He actually says that despite the fact that cabinet directed the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources to, quote, suspend the issuance of all new licenses and permits by the Forestry Commission, and also to suspend the licenses already issued for operation in 47 forest reserves, the directives were ignored and the destruction continued. This is serious, and this is just at the beginning. So he's accusing two large, powerful government entities, the Ministry of Lands and the Forestry Commission, of working against government's own policy. That's serious. We'll, we'll come back to this. Then in the summary as well, he makes reference to uh, Asaro Chodaku, whose role was a lawyer for the mining company Heritage, which we'll come back to later on. Now, the other, things, the, the other thing that jumps at you is the accusation that because the Ministry of Lands, headed by Asuma Chirme, indeed, one of the 10 government ministries in the IMSIM, was not too keen on this fight, they boycotted, for want of a better word, Gallamstop. Now, Gallamstop was a system that was created to really help coordinate, track, manage, and operationalize effectively the fight against Gallamstop. So this Gallamstop, according to the report, integrates with existing platforms from other agencies, helps for synchronization of data, helps to see the status of permits applied for by companies, a powerful tool to strengthen the regulatory agencies. So Gallamstop was big. It was launched. I remember Kojo Ajemai covered the launch of Gallamstop. According to uh, Professor Frimpon Boateng, the Forestry Commission refused to use Gallamstop, and the Mineral Commission approached it half-heartedly. So you're seeing Ministry of Lands, Natural Resources, Forestry Commission, Minerals Commission, not, not being too keen on using this tool that the prof who was the chairman of the committee considered to be very important in fighting Galamsey. Now, the other important point to note is that there were 10 ministries involved. So environment, science, technology headed by Professor Frimpon Boatin. Then there was lands and natural resources initially by Amehu and then later Treme. Then there was local government rural development. I think at the time, Hajia Ali Mamahama, Chief Tensi and Religious Affairs. I think it was Kofi Jameshi at the time. Regional Reorganization and Development, Dambuche, Monitoring and Evaluation, 
I believe it was Akutua say, water and sanitation could feed other interior and brush dairy defense dominatable information could drop on chroma. Now, there's another damning uh, claim made in the report that it was clear from the beginning that this fight was not going to be easy. And according to the minister, apart from the ministers of sanitation and local government, so I'm guessing he's talking about Kofi Ada at the time, sanitation minister, and then local government, Haji Ali Mahama. This is page 11. It says, all the other ministries and ministers, <laughs> this is serious, abandoned the committee. And this is, his, this is words in the, the report. All the ministers for san, all the ministers apart from sanitation and local government and rural development abandoned the committee. To make matters worse, the chairman, Professor Pimpon Bratin saying, was personally attacked, vilified, and framed for things he had not done. He says such assault came from many people, including some of the ministers who effectively left the committee. Now, that, these are very serious things to say, right? That the people who were supposed to be helping him fight the illegal mining were actually fighting him, okay? And then he then talks about the role of Sir John. Again, this is page 10. So I've mentioned three institutions, the Ministry of Lands, Land uh, Forestry, uh, sorry, Lands Commission or Minerals Commission rather, Minerals Commission and then Forestry Commission. Now here's a quote on Sir John. He says, the Forestry Commission uh, refused to use gallum stop, right? He says, although it was worrying, I was not surprised that the Forestry Commission did not migrate onto the gallum stop platforms. Mr. Kojo Ousue Free, aka St. John, was actively giving out timber concessions, even in forest reserves for logging. He also gave forestry entry permits to mining companies, both large and small scale, including those of foreign nationals for prospecting activities at a time when the president had put a ban on this activity. Now, if this is true, it is very, very serious that at the time that the government was trying to stop mining and prospecting in forest reserves, the person running the Forestry Commission was giving permits to mining companies, both large and small, including those of foreign nationals, even though the law prescribes this, for prospecting activities at the time the president had put a ban on the activity. Then he then mentions a gentleman called Charles who's the director of operations in the Forestry Commission, who he accuses of doing this on his behalf, right? And then he actually says that at a meeting at the conference room of the president, he, Prof. Prof. Boating, told the president in the presence of Sir John, that the greatest danger to the forest of Ghana was Sir John. <laughs> wow. So if you put this together with the, the later on story about s selling of forest reserves and all of those issues, maybe it's making sense. But for the chairman of MC, the Minister for Environment, to accuse the chairman of Forestry Commission in front of the president that this person was the greatest danger to forest in Ghana is very, very serious. All right. Now, let's then get into some other key challenges he says he faced. So, for example, he says in page 11 again, mining in forest reserves. He says that the decision taken by the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and its agencies to grant concessions in virtually all forest reserves to mining companies did a lot of harm. This is serious. How does a ministry that's supposed to be part of IMSIM that's fighting illegal mining, decide to grant concessions in virtually all forest reserves. This is what the prof is saying. This was contrary to the directive of the president that all mining activities in forest reserves should be suspended. Almost invariably, the concession owners were not indigents and had no attachment to the communities. He then goes on to say they were given permits to work in the forest without any consultation with traditional rulers, and that he says, here's a quote, I can say on authority that all forest reserves have been invaded by rich miners who have engaged Chinese galamseyers in their operations. Wow, this is 2021 March. Professor Fibon Boateng writing to the chief of staff. I can say on authority that all forest reserves 
have been invaded by rich miners who have engaged Chinese in operation. This is absolutely scandalous if true. Then he goes on to talk about what he refers to as the unwholesome behavior of some MP and government appointees. And this is where he mentions the former MP for Manso Nkwanta. So this MP was MP between 2017 and 2021. And then based on Professor Bob own allegations, this MP lost because he was in the business, according to Professor Bob Boateng, of acquiring several dozens of large-scale concessions in his district, ostensibly for community mining purposes, but which he ended up selling to private individuals, including party members, for 200,000 CDs per concession. Now, in other interviews, Honorable Kwam has come to deny this, right? And I'll show you some of those denials. But then he claims that this infuriated the party at the constituency, for which reason Honorable Kwam lost the primaries in 2020 because a lot of the people in the constituency were not happy with the fact that he has sold the concessions to outsiders. Then another heavy thing was item four. Mining by party officials and government appointees. And then he says that throughout his, or throughout our struggle, he's talking about the team that he worked with, with illegalities in the small scale mining sector. What baffled me was the total disregard of the president's commitment to protect the environment. I can state without any equivocation that many party officials from national to the unit committee level had their friends, PAs, agents. Serious. He says he can state without any equivocation that many party officials from national to unit committee level had their friends, PAs, agents, relatives, financiers, engaged in legal mining. He says most of them engaged the Chinese to work for them, which is actually even worse, because the law is very clear about the role of foreigners. Small-scale mining is reserved for indigents. So for people to then involve foreigners illegally, it's a double crime, right? Then he talks about just, not just party people who had legitimate concessions, but appointees in the Jubilee House who were doing or supporting illegal mining or interfering in the fight against the menace. He mentions Lord Comey, Charles Tego, and Frank Asid Berkwin. Lord Comey has been interviewed. He denies this, says he hasn't been spoken for one But that's not even my focus. There's, a, there's an interesting paragraph on the NDC as well. And if in reading the report, you notice that there's a very murky relationship between party politics and mining generally and Galamse in particular. So in paragraph six, it discusses the Western region and how NDC is very strong there, and the fact that NDC people control the Galamse in the Western region and are able to sponsor candidates to run for primaries or sponsor independent candidates against MPP people. He actually mentions uh, Wasa East District and a few other districts. He talks about Takwa and Suayim, for example. And then let me just read a very interesting part. It says, the NDC in 2020 was given an advantage in terms of access to resources for mining. This is because there are far more NDC people engaged in illegal mining than MPP members in the region. So, so it means that even the Galamse is on party level. Again, when we come to questions, we have questions for NDC as well in this discussion. One of the more heartbreaking aspects of the, the report is Operation Vanguard. And I'm just going to read a paragraph of that. Operation Vanguard is really where men from the military, the police, are charged with controlling illegal activities. So remember Major Mahama, who died, unfortunately. He was part of the Operation Vanguard. Now, according to Professor Mpom Boateng, when the soldiers were withdrawn from the Operation Vanguard on 16th March 2019, due to complaints by small-scale miners, mainly from the MPP stock, the police detachment took over the entire Operation Vanguard. This is when things deteriorated. You think about that. So, <laughs> small scale miners of MPP stock complained about the operations of Operation Vanguard. Soldiers were withdrawn. The police were in charge. According to the good professor, the things got worse when the thing was left with the police. He actually makes some allegation and says, This is where consistent reports from the police developed the habit of going around the mining sites, extorting monies. 
from miners. All right. Then he discusses community mining, which again was rolled out by the president, commissioned at the first site, Wasa Menfi. And he says, this community mining became very popular. But here's a very serious allegation as well. However, he says the Ministry of Lands, especially after the appointment of Honorable Kwekwa Suman Chairman. So you can see that Professor Fifon Boateng and then Honorable Chairman were not on good terms. We have been spoken to Professor Chairman for his side, or Dr. Mr. Chairman for his side, but there's a lot of innuendo and accusation against the, the former lands minister about his role. He says, for example, that Honorable Chairman became hostile and antagonistic to the program. Some elements in the Minerals Commission, including SK Boafu, the chairman of the commission board, supported the position of the Ministry of Lands. Apparently, they were angry that the IMSIM was at the forefront in matters concerning small-scale mining, which they said were among the functions of the Minerals Commission. And the effect of this antagonism was that several community mining sites that the IMSIM had planned and were ready to commission were effectively sabotaged and blocked by the Minerals Commission. He actually alleges that SK Boafo called one DC for Asante Achim Central to block an event with the threat of losing a job. These are very serious allegations. So you are looking at a Ministry of Environment working at cross purposes, the Ministry of Lands, Minerals Commission chair not in the same page. Meanwhile, they are all part of the so-called IMSIM that is supposed to be fighting Galamse. Is it a, a, a surprise that the fight failed? Then he talks about the ban on importation of, cell, uh, of excavators. This is where he, he discusses that, again, in the third quarter of 2018, Government directs there should be a ban on importation of excavators for small-scale mining. Guess what? Ministry of Transport is responsible for making sure the ban is respected. But he then says, subsequent events indicate that the ban was not respected, and presently new excavators are found at illegal mining sites. So this, is, this undermines a lot of the positions publicly stated by the president and government's own policy objectives. He also talks about Chang funds, right, and then... He discusses the role of big men. This is where he mentions Donald Inti of CNJ Alaska. The company's lawyer, Gabby, then he accuses of um, trying to interfere with what he was doing with a phone call and, and all of that. When I come back, I'll deal with some of those personal issues. Now, the reason I'm using this approach is to... It's a 36-page report. We are not sure a lot of you are ready. So I want to give you key highlights of the report. When we come back, some people who have mentioned the report responded. They deserve a right to be heard. So I would bring you some of the things they've said. But I think the most important thing for us is what this report says about the institutions involved in fighting this menace and how dysfunctional they are, how government itself has been weakened by its own dithering on the matter, and how a lot of agencies have many serious questions to answer, some of which we will pose on this program. This is the point of view. We're looking at the Professor Fremont Boateng Exposé. Stay with us. Pepsodent introduces charcoal and lemon essence. The unique combination of natural essences whitens teeth naturally for you and family because every smile matters. New Pepsodent Herbal. Introducing a unique combination of herbal extracts in an antibacterial toothpaste for strong teeth and healthy gums that protects your family and you. Every smile matters. African Nacity is using plastic waste to provide affordable homes. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight, we're bringing you highlights of a, a report that the former Minister for Environment, Professor Fimfon Boateng, sent to the Chief of Staff in 2021 about the activities of the IMSIM and how it struggled because of sabotage and its little successes. Uh, we've so far given you some highlights of the report. I wanted to give you some quick quotes which have had reactions. So one of the big items has been the role of Asarachi Daku who is a, a lawyer and a cousin to the president, on page 16 of the report, in discussing what he calls so-called big men above, 
where he discusses Charles Wilson, Director of Operations Affairs Commission, and Donald Entia of CNJ Alaska. He, he makes reference to Kweku Baku and then also talks about uh, Gabi Ochidako. Let me just read what he says. He says, um, using satellite imagery, we're following, we have followed activities of imperial heritage over the years till date. The damage caused in the forest is many times greater than what happened in Diaso, which is where CNG Alaska, a company that Mr. Uh, Entia had been part of prior to this tenure, was involved in. We were ready to dislodge the imperial heritage from Cobro Forest when Mr. Gabi Ochidako called to inform me that he was the lawyer for Heritage Imperial Limited, a company that was destroying the Cobro and Apaprama Forest Reserve, and in the process had also polluted and diverted the course of the River of Finn, as can be seen in the satellite images below. I informed the president about the behavior of Mr. Gabi Ochidako, and he promised to deal with it. All right. Now, what is, what is happening here is that because of the perceived influence of Ochidako, to be a lawyer for a company that is on a collision course with the minister, will definitely place the minister in a difficult position, for which reason he reports to the president. But Mr. Chidakon was interviewed on City News, and his response was that this, the company he represents, Heritage, had a mining exploration permit issued in July 2019, and a forest entry permit issued in November 2018, and an EPA permit. Yet soldiers, upon the direction of the minister, had gone to the forest to stop them. So basically, he was calling the minister to ask why they were doing this. It's also important to note that Following the seizure of all of this equipment, the company went to court and did get a judgment, vindicating it somewhat in the matter of the seizure of its equipment, the closure of some of its mining operations. So those judgments are there to be read. But there's been a back and forth. So Gabi denies trying to interfere in the process. He says, I was acting as a lawyer. Professor Fibor Barton then responds again and then attaches more evidence of what heritage did and what CJ Alaska is said to have done. So that was one issue. Now, a lot of this has been discussed in the media, so I don't want to go into all of this. There's another one with the information minister as well, where, again, he says he is disapp uh, disappointed in Professor Fibon Boatin, but you forgive him because the, the prof mentions about how information minister and some journalists from both MPP and NDC met somewhere in Dodoa to plan to damage him. Again, information minister comes to deny this. Professor Fibon Boatin comes back to advise Kojo Ponkroma. So we don't want to make this about the personal he says, she says, because even though those are important, that's not the main issue here. There's another one, Joseph Albert Kwam, again, former MP for Manso. He comes out to deny what Prof says. So again, it's going to be a back and forth. There are two parties. They can decide how to treat it, go to court. But it's important to note that Gabi, Kojo, and Joseph are all denied aspects of what was attributed to them. No problem. Lord Comey's name was mentioned. He was also interviewed. He says he's never spoken to Professor Frimpon Boating. Again, he says he's disappointed. But the, the key point is the presidency itself. Now, what is baffling is that when the interview was held from the government, we're interfering with the Galamse fight under his tenure, it was reported that the presidency had ordered an investigation and directed the CID to go into this. But the presidency, following the publication of this report in the media, then comes out to, to say that the document that we are discussing were, were not, or was not an official report formally delivered to the office of the president, and that on the contrary, this report can be rightly referred to as a catalog of personal grievances and claims made by the prof intending to respond to issues he faced as chairperson of the IMSEM. We, we feel that this is not fair because if you've already asked an investigation to what the man said, and based on, and if you listen to the man's interview, a lot of what he's saying in the interview is in the report. All right? And again, this is a report he submitted to the chief of staff. Chief of staff is the most powerful person in that place, apart from the president. So there are lots of questions the presidency has to answer, right? And we'll deal with those questions. Because if a, 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 the chairman of a 10-minister committee has issued a 36-page report accusing specific people of things done, what did you do with those reports? Did you do further investigation? Did you ask him to substantiate? Did you get written responses from all the people accused? All right, why do you wait till the GTV interview to then say you're going to investigate? All right, and do you, has the investigation finished? If the investigation is not finished, why are you now saying it's hearsay? Now, if, if the man's words deserve an investigation on a, based on a TV interview, don't you think a 36-page report reserves a more investigation. So the presidency has questions to answer, and, I, and I'll, deal with, I'll deal with some of, some of this as well, right? But 
the, the, the other problem with the responses we've seen appears to be a focus more on people clearing themselves than in dealing with the issue of the fact that the fight did not succeed. That the claim the president made that he was going to put his presidency on the line to fight Galamse was being undermined ab initio, allegedly, by people he appointed. I mean, very, very serious. So in terms of questions to be answered, we've already hinted this, that the, the presidency has questions to answer. So for example, this report was given to the chief of staff in March 2021. How come we didn't hear anything about it until now and until the interview with the media? So that's a legitimate question that needs to be answered. Number two, when the presidency said they were going to investigate or direct the to investigate this, I mean, have they come up with a full report? How on earth do you then, within that process, come and say that what is being discussed in the media is hearsay? I mean, a 36-page report versus a 45-minute interview, which would have more substance that would deserve more investigation so there's a lot of this and for example when the report was given to chief of staff was it discussed was he asked to substantiate were ministers who were accused of sabotaging the process written to to respond were they asked to step aside right there's lots of governance questions around how the government works because if cabinet ministers have been accused of sabotaging a major government program which almost every day was in the news how come we haven't heard anything until after the interview with GTV and then we are told that this should be investigated? And then if the investigation is not over, how are you referring to this as hearsay? So that's a question that needs to be answered, right? And then the IMSIM itself, the prof makes a very serious allegation that apart from two ministries, sanitation and local government, all the ministers abandoned the committee. I think it's legitimate to ask all the IMSIM ministers from information to defense to mining to local government, all these ministries, religious and chieftaincy affairs, regional reorientation, monitoring and evaluation, all these ministries, bar the two, in fact, all of them, including the two, should be made to render an account of their stewardship under the IMSIM, right? Or maybe the prof should be asked to, to give minutes. So if, for example, you say that, if you say they abandoned the, the committee's work. Does that mean they didn't attend meetings? Were there minutes being taken? These things can be investigated, right? Because you have 10 ministries working to fight Galamse. And the, the guy chairing the committee says, all the ministers, it didn't say ministries, it's a ministers, abandoned the committee. Does that mean they didn't turn up personally? That they let their, uh, their subordinates attend the meetings? I mean, this is a serious thing that requires a response from all the ministries involved. If the president could ask, all the ministers to give a written stewardship of their activities under the 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 the, the, uh, the IMSIM, right and then the specific ministry of lands and forestry commission I, I think the tenure of sir john under the forestry commission needs to be thoroughly investigated if you look at the the the, the claims about granting of mining concessions and the disregard for the president's directive uh, forest for mining which was prescribed and then felling of trees that were not to have been done. I think the tenure of Sir John as Forestry Commission Chair really deserves a, a, a separate investigation if possible. Again, the, the minister, of course, Sir John is not here to speak for himself, so they may have to do, I don't know, a desk base, whatever. But then the Ministry of, I haven't had a Minister of Land, former Minister of Land come to respond to the allegations. But I also think that there needs to be some inquest into the role of the Ministry of Lands from 2018 to 2021 in the Galamsey fight, because this is the ministry that's at the forefront. They supervise the Minerals Commission. Again, the Minerals Commission itself, chaired by SK Boafo at the time, there's, there needs to be a serious investigation into all the licenses they granted. So Forestry Commission, Minerals Commission, Ministry of Lands, needs special investigation over a specific period, okay? Now, the security agencies also need to be investigated because we are seeing conflicts, right? We're talking about soldiers guarding mining concessions. Now. Has the army, for example, have a list of sanctioned mining operations that it gave men and women to protect? Has it internally checked whether some of their men went to rope to protect private companies? All of that murkiness needs to be resolved. And the police, I mean, think about it. The minister is saying that when the soldiers left Gavanga, the police were now extorting money. This is a specific period. The IGP can write to the minister and say, look, can you give more details about the police that were involved in this extortion? We are, we are interested in investigating, even if pips at all. Because the thing is, if, if these high-profile agencies cannot be trusted to fight Galamse, what hope do we have as a country? Right? So the armed forces itself, the army and the police, 
they need to do internal inquiries into their role in supporting a legitimate government program and then the innuendos and the claims that some of their people were involved in wrongdoing. These are very serious. Again, the chiefs and traditional rulers, Prof mentions that a lot of the destruction that happened to our forests and our water bodies, the chiefs were not happy with this, right? I haven't had any chief come out to support Prof, right? I haven't had any chief. He, 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 he talks about a lot of the people who are foreigners entering mining uh, forests and river bodies and destroying these water bodies on the blind side of the chiefs. And the chiefs called him to complain. Some chiefs should come out. You see, this is the problem. We say, Ghana, we want the truth. A prof has come out with a lot of things. How come we are not hearing from any of the chiefs who say, look, it's true. Within this period, I complained to the prof and he spoke to me about this. There should be, where are all the chiefs? He mentions the Eastern region. He talks about the president's hometown and makes serious accusations about how people were wantonly interested in almost disgracing the president in the way they were doing the illegal mining. What are the chiefs in those communities saying? All right? They cannot be quiet. Civil society, nobody has come out to defend Professor Primo Bhatti. Look, we, we were making a lot of noise when Martin Amidu and the Mills came out to say that there were gangatuan crimes committed against the state that he was going to prevent. He said he wanted to resign. Then he was sacked. This is the same thing, right? So it's also like when a minister or somebody from government wants to do the right thing, all his colleagues gang up against him, civil society goes quiet. All those who worked with Prof joined the IMSIM, they should come and tell us. Can they corroborate some of the things he's saying? Why should he be left as the last man standing? Why should it always be one person? Where are all the groups? Yes, we've heard Ken Asigbe and Co come out to make comments, but we need more, all right? Because Arocha, for example, we're talking about mining in forest reserves. The Prof says the Lands Commission, sorry, the, the Minerals Commission, Forestry Commission, and the Ministry of Lands were giving out mining concessions in almost all our forest reserves. Civil society needs to come out and speak with clarity, all right? Then I think the prof himself has a couple of questions to answer. Of course, some will say, why did you wait for two years? You gave the report to the chief of staff, 2021, and then 2023, you, you give an interview. You could say, well, he could have come out earlier. I don't know. I don't want to major too much on that because here we, we tend to major on why didn't the person who did the whistle blowing say this? I disagree with that. I'm saying that we wouldn't be talking about this. The whole country wouldn't be discussing this if he hadn't granted that interview or if he's the one who caused the leak. So, but yes, he does have some questions to answer about the timing of this, whether it's a question of self-preservation. There have been accusations in the media about his son and relatives getting involved in Galamse. He, he has to respond to those as well. So yes, he has to. But I'm not, I'm not sure those are necessarily the most important issues. But they are, they are issues nonetheless, right? And the other question I have for him is, he, he, he handed over to Dr. Ifrie, right, MP for safety, we also. Are the contents of this report in this handing over notes? It's interesting to see what notes were handed over to the new minister, which will help us see, and then we can also start measuring this new minister's approach to fighting uh, a Galamse, all right? NDC too has questions to answer, right? Because NDC issued a statement. They said, oh, there's a web of corruption, Galamse. The minister is claiming that there are far more NDC people engaged in illegal mining in, than MPP in the Western region. He mentions the Western region. He also talks about the history of the NDC. So it's, it's very clear that there's a link between party politics and Galamse. And he actually discusses this. So the NDC should also be interested in finding out which of his members are illegally mining, particularly in the Western region. Now, let's list a few worrying observations before we go. There is now a clearly established link between illegal mining, whether large or small scale, and partisan politics. This should worry every agent of good governance because we are talking about financing of campaigns. If people do illegal activity and can channel that into our politics, there's no hope. They will corrupt the police, they corrupt the army, they corrupt the media, they corrupt everybody. So it's something that we should be all concerned about. The other issue is the role of influential people. Influence peddling. He mentions lots of people's names. We don't have time. S some uh, secretary or official in chief of staff office, somebody in the presidency, who may not even officially be mandated. They may not even be acting in the knowledge of their bosses. But there's a lot of influence peddling, which this report is leaking. We, we know this, but this is concrete. Uh, 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 somebody coming from inside to tell us, right? Again, the, the dysfunction seen in government is very troubling. Where you are, you're seeing... Turf Wars, Ministry of Environment versus Ministry of Lands, and then the apparent 
weakness of the, the president, or I don't know how to wear his weakness. Like, he makes a statement, he makes an order, and it's like people he has appointed are disregarding it, and nothing happens to them. And this isn't the first thing, right? It's, it's something we should be very concerned about, that in the public, the media goes out, stop Galamse now. We are all fighting Galamse. We go and launch a, a, a program. Then behind the scenes, Imsim Chair says, of the 10 ministers, only two are involved in the fight. The rest are against. That's very serious. How do you say? And these are, I feel these are issues that deserve a lot of attention, not just the personality fights, which are also important. But if eight out of 10 ministries are not working on the same wavelength as the ministry, and they're actually abandoning posts, it's very serious. Defense ministry, interior ministry, information ministry, I mean, very, very serious, right? And then the way the media has been involved in this as well. So, like, Prabhupada Mbati talks about Kweku Baku's role. Again, I don't have time to discuss all of that because both of them have reacted, so I don't want to take a position necessarily. But my point is that the media, we also need to be guarded because when I look at the way we reported this, it's been also the... Reports have been, uh, Prof said this, Gabi said this, uh, this man said this, that person said that. Those things are okay, but... How does this lead to poverty, destruction of our water bodies? You know, we, we, need, we, we need to be a bit more nuanced. And I take part of the blame because we've also jumped on the bandwagon. So I take back. So looking at the way we've conducted ourselves, I feel we could have done a better job, which is why we're trying to say, okay, let's give people highlights of the report. Because people haven't even read the report. Yet we are discussing and getting reactions and things. I don't think it's the best. All right. And then one thing that worries me is that most of the discourse has been about whether this person did this or not, not many people have been talking about the environment except the good prof. He's the only person who, in his write-up, will show you the water body. He will show you the forest reserve. So he, he actually appears to be the only person who's actually thinking about the environment. Everybody else thinking about defending themselves. Yes, defend yourself. But if we are really committed to fighting Kalamse, we should all be thinking about how come such a high-profile fight suffered such a catastrophic failure and it had to take a leaked report for all of us to be discussing it. Shame on all of us. Honestly, same on all of us. So I think the ball is firmly in the court of the government. But I also think the Shiraz angle is good. Roxin Dafia McPaul will be speaking about that when we come back. And then hopefully we'll tie all the loose ends. Finally, anyone can become a household. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you will flip a real estate gaming platform that allows you to play and stand a chance of winning a house or cash or consolidated yeah! funds, such as savings towards a house. Simple and easy to play. Visit www.yougoflip.com. Buy a ticket to enter the game. Wait for the end of the game. To enjoy the win. Anyway, and win. Flip it or own it. You go flip. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Play responsible, not for persons below 18 years, and gaming can be addictive. All right, we will now speak to the Member of Parliament for South Dai, who has caused his lawyers to write to Shraj to actually investigate this self-same report and some of the information coming out from this. Honorable Roxen Eche Dafi Amekpo is joining us. He's in his constituency campaigning, but we called him to just give us an insight into why he's taking this action. This is important because quite a number of people have called for different things. So the NBC itself has called for the... Uh, parliament to go into this. They've asked the special prosecutor to go into this. But Roxon has actually taken a step by directing his lawyer, Nick Bako Samoado, to write to Shraj. And Shraj has received the petition. So, Honorable Roxon, thanks for joining us. You are not waiting at all for Parliament or anybody. You have written to Shraj. What do you want Shraj to do in the matter of the Frimpon Boating Report Exposé? Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. And a good evening to. Are we on TV or? or yeah, we are. We are on, on television. We are on, okay. on television. 
Okay, uh, good evening to your viewers. First of all, the shocking that report that was submitted over two years ago uh, is now receiving reaction from persons who have been cited in the report. It, it, it means that, but for the decision of the leader of the task force to come public, this report would have been controlled from everyone. That, that is what is evident. So I am simply asking the constitutionally established body of SHAC to look into the matter and come out with this report to guide the nation going forward. Bernard, if you if you look through our budget for 2018, 2019, 2020, you will see how much money we expended as a nation on the activities of this committee or tax force. The tax force was only disbanded in January 2021. So if you look at the speech of the report, Dr. Fulfon Boatin sent the report sometime in March 2021. I think the report was sent because of the closure of the collapse of the tax force. So he decided to send a final report on the activities of the committee for about three years running to the presidency. So... In terms of specific things you are asking, Shraj, are you asking them to investigate people or you're simply saying they should take the report again and determine no, what, no. What, 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 what is in there? What are you asking? No, no, the, the, report, the report is the evidence. Okay. So public officers have been indicted in the report. So to, they are supposed to investigate abuse of office and conflict of interest on behalf of public officers who got the opportunity to serve in this committee or tax force. And that is what Strass Mandate says. It, it, it's that simple. What, what, typically when Strass does an investigation like, in, like this, what can it be used for? We can proceed on it criminally. No, no. It can lead to prosecution. Why did you opt for Shraj and not, say, Special Prosecutor? Special Prosecutor, for me, is it's established to primarily look into corruption and corruption-related matters. Abuse of office and abuse of conflict of interest matters are really not within the mandate of Office of the Special Prosecutor. It actually falls within the mandate of Shraj. And we need to distinguish between these two statutory bodies. So I think that the, the best institution or state institution suited for this investigation is track. Because of the manner of the content of the report of Professor Fafimpon Boati. He has indicted his own colleagues in terms of their conduct in public office. I, I, I see. But you are aware that he also indicts the NDC party of which you are a member of where he he talks yes, about Bernard, he talks Bernard, about the, let, the, the role I, of I the not, ndc in no no no, 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 let, me, no let, let, let me ask my question he, he talks <laughs> about the role of the ndc in the western region involving yeah. ndc people involved in illegal mining in the western region yes and and the, and the other point i'm and asking is your, your party itself is asking for parliament and osp so my my my, my view is question is in terms of your approach this means that your party will be investigated as well why? If anybody in my party is found to be culpable, why not? In any case, if you say NDC members, who specifically are you speaking of? I am an NDC member. If you say a deputy minister within the NDC administration, who exactly are you referring to? And even the innuendo is not, is not qualified enough. It's just an innuendo. If you say a deputy minister in an NDC administration, you haven't said anything. If you say NDC members, mm. NDC has 80 million registered members. So, so if people have what he said to, he could have been more specific. He could have been, he could have been, he could have given further and better particulars. Mm. Mm. But in the case of his NDC colleagues, he was very particular. Okay. He was, he was, he was, he was, he, was, he wrote down to exactitude. He mentioned names, he gave dates, right. gave names of communities, titles. Mm. Fair enough. So, have you been given any assurances of the timeliness of the work of Shiraj? 
Yes, 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 yes. They've assured me that they will give it the highest priority possible. In fact, that's also made headline. So I'm hopeful that the, the, the report will receive a lot of attention, and I'm praying that they will, they will even conduct a public hearing on the matter. Finally, you said that the report is the evidence. Do you expect the prof to be called to speak to the report, or the report speaks for itself? No. So, people on Boati will have to will have to be invited for him to speak to the document. You 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 know that government have sort of um, um, uh, watered down the document, claiming that it's not official and all that. So, he will have to be invited to speak to it. In any case, he has to be heard. Wonderful. He has to be heard. Yes. We'll leave you here. Thank you for your time, Honorable Roxin Eche Dafiameko. It's my pleasure, my brother. He's the MP for South Dai. He has caused his lawyer to write to Shraj to ask for a full-scale investigation into the content of this report. So that's all we, we have time for. We've been tracing the trajectory of this uh, Galamse or Imsim or illegal mining expose by Professor Pimpon Boating, spoke, spoken to Roxin Dafiameko, the MP for South Dai, who has sent a, a, a petition to Shraj, but really tracing the history, asking some key institutions some questions, and also observing some worrying trends about the fight. Th thanks for watching. We, we hope you've gotten a better rounded view of the matters and you can make a better informed choice in terms of how you speak to your local authority about the fight against illegal mining. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Another season of the City FM Family Consecration is here again. Your family radio station invites you to the 2023 edition of the Family Consecration Service. Let's hold ourselves in readiness as we prepare for a time of divine renewal, visitation, and restoration for our families and loved ones. Join us on Monday, 1st of May, 2023, at the Winners Chapel, Ghana, Accra, near the OA Bus Terminal Circle, as we intercede and commit our families to God. It's going to be a six-hour intense moment of prayer time for families from 6 a.m. till 12 noon. Come and let us reinforce the